Square, also known as Block, has absolutely fallen a ton in the last year. It's one of those hype stocks that if you look back at our videos, we were telling people, be very careful. The numbers don't make sense to us. So we're going to reevaluate it now that it's fallen a lot. We love when stocks fall a lot. It enters into our wheelhouse. We start looking at the stock. Is this an opportunity to buy? Because Mo and I are value investors. I've been teaching value investing for the last 10 years and the last three years on YouTube. But just because I have a YouTube channel or just because anyone has a YouTube channel does not make them an expert. But I guarantee you that if you watch this video and watch four other videos of mine, you will walk away understanding money and investing just a little bit more and say, you know what? I may not agree with everything this guy says, but he's logical and has a process and that will make a lot of sense for you. So let's go look at Square using our software. Bum, ba, dum, bum. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize it dropped that much. This is October of 2021, $269 a share. And Holy we are currently cow. sitting at 60. And remember, this is the seventh highest holding in ARK K. Oh, another ARK stock that it's has collapsed. Are, it's just weird. So the uh, the master of diminishing wealth, Kathy Wood, <laughs> loves her Roku. Has a, The only stock that's actually not fallen a ton is Tesla. Tesla. <laughs> but it's still fallen. Up. It's still fallen, but it's holding everything up. All right, so let's go through our eight pillar process to understand square block by the numbers. So pillar number one is going to be done by Mo. So Mo, take it away. Okay. So five year PE less than 22 and a half percent. And we are just barely above it at 670. <laughs> so not bad. I'm no, just kidding. It's terrible guys. Okay. This is now the next thing. ROIC. When I look at ROIC, I think to myself for a big company, this is how I can tell how the company is investing back in itself. This is the, I'm, I can't talk to the CEO. I can't talk to the CFO, but I can look at ROIC and see how they're investing back in themselves. They're a newer company, so they are putting a lot of money into themselves. But that ROIC number sitting right now, 2.1%. That's not good. I want to see that thing greater than nine. 2.1% is obviously not greater than nine. Now, in defense of them, they're still a growing still company. Growing company. I'm okay. I'm not, it's, it's not like I'm looking at it saying, oh, this is a Microsoft. It's less, and this is bad. No, I'm okay with it. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but I am okay with it. For pillar number three, we want five-year revenue growth. 2.68 billion in 2018 to 16.29 billion. So that is a check, but there was that big, big jump between 2020 and 2021 that we're going to have to factor into stock analyzer tool. Pillar number four, net income over the last five years. They had a big loss here in uh, this past year and net income, I mean, they are losing more money. 61.65 billion uh, million to 449 million. That's an X. They're losing more money. Not a good situation, but again, they are a newer company. I just don't like that they're losing more. Yeah, but I think you bring up a good valid point on the revenue growth. Is it a permanent revenue jump? Because if you look at one thing I want to mention here, 15.93 to 16.29, barely any growth there. Yeah. So that's kind of concerning. Right. Okay. Now, pillar number five, guys. This is an important one. As the company continues to lose money, they have to fund their losses with either debt or equity. When you, when you raise money through equity, you're issuing shares. Square made an acquisition a couple years ago in the last year for $30 billion and they issued shares for that acquisition. Now I understood that because the stock is so expensive, I want them to be doing that versus taking on debt or using their cash to make overpriced acquisitions. But are they diluting their owners? That's the question. So in order to figure this out, we go back to six, the end of six years, they had 376 million shares outstanding. Last year, 581. Guys, they are diluting the heck. Yeah out of their owners, which means you are getting a smaller and smaller piece of the pie as they do that. Now, it could be justified with more growth, right. but we saw in the last year. There's no, I mean, there's very limited growth. They issued 130 million more shares. And they only grew like 1%, not even 1%. Exactly. So that's kind of concerning. Pillar number six has to do with debt. And guys, debt works for a company the same way it works for you. The more debt a company has, the harder it is to manage that during bad times. So what's a reasonable amount of debt? Well, the metric I have come up with is I take their five-year average free cash flow that we have on the main page of our software, 325 million, and I multiply it by five. That is $1.6 billion, essentially. So we want their long-term liabilities under $1.6 billion. So I scroll up, I go to the balance sheet, I scroll all the way down, long-term liability is five billion. Thanks. Now, again, they are a growing company. Growing, yep. So if their free cash flow all of a sudden tripled because they started being more stable, it would be justifiable. But again, it's not right now. 
Now, pillars seven and eight have to do with free cash flow. So what is free cash flow? Free cash flow is cash from operations, less your capital expenditures. There are five things you can do with free cash flow. Buy back shares, pay dividends, pay down debt, reinvest back in yourself, or make acquisitions. You can do any combination of this. All five, one, three, doesn't matter. But this is the lifeblood of the business. In our cash flow statement, I've added this line to make the math easy for you. So five years ago, they did 71 million in free cash flow. Last year, 564 million in free cash flow. They've actually been cash flow positive for the last six years, which is an impressive feat. It is impressive. Now, the reason they're showing losses is probably depreciation and writing things off, et cetera. But the cash flow, there is cash flow that is growing, which I like seeing. And our final metric, just like the first metric was five year PE at 22.5. We want to figure out what market cap to pay for the company based on the same multiple of free cash flow. So we take the 325 million, we multiply it by 22.5, and that equals so 6.5 and 65 is 7.1. So 7.2, call it billion dollars. We want the market cap under 7.2 billion. Mo, what is it? 36 and a half billion. Okay. So it's a big X there. And guys, and that's after a fall from $269 a share. That's incredible. Yeah. So they were, a th they were a $200 billion company just a year ago. Now, guys, that's a lot of math I threw at you. And our software does all the math for you right here. And look at this, a lot of Xs. These are my biggest concerns right here. Yes, their company is growing. But let's even look at the analyst estimates. What's their growth level for the company? Now, look at this. I like this. Mo, do you see this? Yeah, that's big. From a dollar to $7 projected. Now, these are only 48 analysts, and there are way more analysts out there covering the company. Our data feed only gives us 48. And look at the revenue numbers. Revenue They're numbers. looking at almost 20% high, double, high teens growth in the next five years. Yeah. So if a company is growing really fast, it should justify a higher valuation. But the question is, how high is too high? Because it's possible to overpay. Go look at Intel, Cisco, Micron, all these companies back in 2000 that still have not hit their 2000 peak. Because even though their companies are two, three, four times larger because of overvaluation, people paid too much. It's absolutely, this is what makes value investors, value investors. They understand that it's possible to overpay for growth. So that's why we created the stock analyzer tool. And this tool allows us to make assumptions about the future because every investment's the present value of all future cash flow. So let's make assumptions about the future. And it tells us what price to pay for the stock today based on those assumptions. Now, I highly encourage you to rewatch the stock analyzer part to understand how we're looking at this because Mo and I are going to talk about this a little bit more thoroughly. So, Mo, do you think it's reasonable to do a 10 year analysis? We can, but we can't use those. We can't, well, we, we can, can exchange. We can base it off of that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, first thing is revenue growth. Guys, in the last 10 years, they've done 64%. Last five years, 57. Last year, 2.2. But analysts were expecting for the next five years high teens. So, as a company gets larger and larger, it's harder to grow. So for a 10-year number, Mo, what do you give me for the low, middle, and high? Um, maybe 8, 10, and 12. Okay. But even on, the, even on the low side, I could go even lower. I actually think 6, six 9, and, and 12. Or it's actually 6, 10, and 14. Because I do think it's possible for them to grow 14% a year for the next 10 years if the next five years are high double digits. Right. What about profit margin? Now, this is the hard part because, hard because we don't... profit's going to skyrocket the next five years as they generate more and more profit. Right. But what... after year five, it could come back to normalcy. What's their five? What's their um gross margin? Gross margin is thirty one point two. Okay, so what's a company like? Like, go to PayPal. Let's go look at. So here's what we're doing here, guys. We don't have profit for Square. We don't have profit for Block. So we have to find similar companies that have similar gross margins and see what their bottom line margin that are more established companies are generating. So PayPal is something similar, but I think PayPal's gross margin is a lot higher than than Square. Yeah. So their their gross margin is. 51.4. So 20% higher, 20 right. bips higher. And the last 20 the last 10 years have been 14.5. Okay. Profit margin. All right. Remember, so, they, I mean, that, that's in, they also had COVID factored into that. So I might want to bring that number down a little bit. Um, okay. Maybe. But if you look at the last, okay, I got you. But it's pretty consistent if you look at profit margin over, over the last five years. 10 years. Yeah. Five and 10. Okay. So what do you feel comfortable with on profit margin for square? Maybe we put in eight, 11, and 14. Okay. Now here's one thing, guys. The reason Mo is hesitating is because we don't have profit for Square. And PayPal has a much higher gross margins. So to make an accurate 
Apple's like, like one thing if they're not making profit, but their gross margins also significantly lower than PayPal. 51% versus 31% is a very big difference in this world. That means on $10 billion in revenue, PayPal is making $2 billion more on that 10 billion than Square would. And that's something to consider there. Now, what about for a free cash flow margin, Mo? Because we don't know, I'd probably put in the same numbers. I agree. And because they've already they'll... shown free cash flow versus profit margin, right. which I kind of like. Right. So the next area is PE. Now the PE we're looking at is not today's PE. It's the PE at the end of our 10 year analysis and the price of free cash flow at the end of our 10 year analysis. So what is a reasonable PE that the company has grown into at some point? The historical average for all companies is 15 or 16. So Mo, what do you think here? 16, 18, and 20. They do have a lot of growth on their side. But at the end of 10 years, they're still going to have grown lower. Yeah. 18 but, on the high side. I, it's, this is a hard one for me for this kind of company. So I, I, I have a hard time giving higher than 15 to start on the low side. Okay. So what about 14, 17, and 20? Okay. Because if block ends up working, if blockchain ends up working, mm -hmm. then they probably have a lot more potential in that sphere. And the same thing for price of free cash flow. We tend to keep those exactly the same. Now, finally, our desired return. You got to go high here. So guys, here's the deal. When our low assumptions here, we want to pick a lower desired return because you can get 9 or 10% a year by buying a low cost ETF. But you're buying an individual company here and you want some margin of safety. So you should pick a higher number than 9 or 10%. So I think for this, and remember the other thing, we're also assuming some numbers here that they haven't hit. Mm -hmm. So we need even more conservative assumptions. My personal opinion is 15, 20, and 25%. That's what I thought you were going to go with. Okay. What do you think? I agree with that. Now, usually I do 12 and a half, 15, and 17 and a half. But again, we've made a lot of assumptions here on a lot of areas that I don't feel comfortable with. That's yeah, very speculative. Very speculative. So I need a higher return to justify that. Now, I'm going to hit the analyze button. Below, six numbers are going to pop up. Those six numbers are going to tell me three prices based on some sort of um, multiple of earnings and three prices based on some sort of multiple of free cash flow. If it's all green, it does not mean that you should go out and buy the company. It means make sure these assumptions are correct. There are several ways to do that. Go on Google, go look at other analyst expectations. But an easy way is join our community at everythingmoney.com there are thousands of people in here that have conversations about every company out there. So check it out, everythingmoney.com. So $62 a share, boom. Low side, 29, high side, 55, middle, 41. Now guys, you see it, it's on my watch list of 55. It doesn't mean I'm buying it at 55. It means I'm gonna start doing more research at $55 per share. So it's getting close to my strike price. Thanks very much. See you at the next video. But all of these together, guys, all of these tell me a story. What does it tell me about Microsoft? It's expensive. Now, obviously, if you watch our videos, the Stock Analyzer tool, which is phenomenal, 